everybody. This is Professor Wells, and today we're going to go over Chapter 14, which gets into more depth of the dental cement that is used in the office. Dental cements typically have multiple uses. The dentist will choose the type of cement to use according to the procedure or the purpose of placement. It's the responsibility of the dental auxiliary to know the particulars and the proper manipulation of each cement. Cements can be used for many things. Pulpal irritation can occur as the result of thermal conductivity, bacterial effects of caries, the biological response to chemicals contained in certain restorative material, and even cutting of the tooth structure. This happens when the layer of dentin remaining over the pulp is too thin to withstand compressive, tensile, and shearing stresses. Cavity varnishes, liners, and bases act as a protective layer between the dentin and the restorative material. Varnishes are solutions of natural resins or synthetic resins dissolved in a solvent such as alcohol or chloroform. It's applied in layers where it seals the tubules from the penetration of irritating chemicals protecting the pulp. Calcium hydroxide is used as a low strength liner or base in cavity preps where the dentin no longer covers the pulp. Calcium hydroxide has an alkaline pH between 9 and 11. This stimulates secondary dentin when in direct contact with the pulp, providing a barrier between the pulp and the restoration. It also has antimicrobial and thermal insulating properties and also provides minimal strength to support force. It's important to understand the different methods dental cements can be used and the manipulation requirements for each application. The bacterial effects of caries, the biological response to chemicals contained in restorative materials, and even the cutting of a, the tooth structure can cause pulpal irritation. This can also occur as a result of thermal conductivity of metal restorations placed over or near the pulp. And when the dentin remaining over the pulp is too thin to withstand the compressive tensile and shearing stresses. Cavity varnish acts as a protective barrier between the preparation and restoration. Varnish Varnish formulations are solutions of natural resins or synthetic resins dissolved in a solvent, such as alcohol or chloroform, as stated in the previous slide. They are applied in two to three layers to allow evaporation voids to be sealed. Not used as often today because they tend to wash out at the margins. Uh, many preps are not as aggressively made. Uh, before, if you had just an occlusal filling, they would take out the entire occlusal instead of just the area where decay was. Okay. Calcium hydroxide is used as a low strength base or liner and cavity preparations in which dentin no longer covers the pulp. It stimulates reparative dentin formation. The calcium hydroxide has an alkaline pH between 9 and 11, which we discussed in the previous slide as well. High strength base or liners provide a thermal insulation and support for restorations. Cements used as a base are mixed to a secondary consistency, which is a thick putty-like consistency. In preparations with an estimated two millimeters or less dentin remaining, a base is often recommended. This figure uh, is a line drawing of cement liner and base. So you can see where the liner is there, how close it is to the pulp. A buildup, much like a high strength base or liner, provides mechanical support for a restorative material when an excessive amount of tooth structure is removed or missing. Placing a buildup reinforces the compromised tooth structure and gives support and a foundation before a crown preparation. Resin modified glass ionomer and resin cement are the strongest of these cements. This figure shows a radiograph of a cement buildup over a uh, root canal treated tooth number 30 to reinforce the remains of the tooth preparation for crown placement. So in other words, if you don't have enough tooth structure for a crown to adhere to, the crown's not gonna last as long. That crown needs structure to hold on to. So that's why we really do the buildup. Looting cements achieve retention by filling the interface between the restoration and the tooth substrate, much like household cements. 
Bonding cements are stronger than looting cements and fill the interface and provide micromechanical retention between the tooth substrate and the resin-based cement and restorative materials. Good adhesion requires physical, chemical, and or mechanical mechanisms that bind the tooth structure to the restoration. Cements used for permanent or temporary looting of fixed prosthesis, orthodontic bands, and pins and posts must have good wettability and flow to provide a thin film thickness. When the tooth structure and fixed prostheses are in intimate contact, a microscopic space exists. This is the tooth restoration interface. The primary purpose of looting cement is to fill the interface. Cements mixed to primary consistency must have thin enough viscosity to be able to flow into a film thickness of 0.25 UMs or less. If the viscosity of the cement is such that the prosthesis fails to regain intimate contact with the tooth, a thick layer of cement will be exposed at the margin. So this, if you remember what viscosity means, means how well the material can flow under compression. So when you're placing a crown on a prepped tooth, you can't have that thick cement because it won't flow as well. It's going to leave a gap. It can make the crown sit a little higher than it's supposed to. So when the patient bites down, they're hitting that crown first. So that's why we need to have that thin, very viscous material. For orthodontic bands and brackets, the cement must adhere tenaciously to the enamel and the orthodontic appliance to provide leverage for tooth movement. Demineralization of the tooth surface caused by the solubility of cement with the resultant leakage of bacteria between the band and the tooth surface has been problematic. Cements that contain fluoride have helped to minimize this problem. So oftentimes you will see adults and they have the white areas on the teeth where it looks like decalcification occurred. Usually that's a sign that they had braces as a child. Uh, even when you have children with braces on, it's really important that you stress to the child and the parent um, that to maintain proper brushing and flossing, even though it's a pain in the butt to floss under those wires. Because of their lower strength and wear resistance and higher solubility, cements are not frequently chosen as permanent restorations. The exception is a glass ionomer cement that is used at the cervical portion of a tooth. Temporary or provisional and intermediate restorations used in dental cements or use dental cements in secondary consistency for their sedative effects. Provisional restorations are used for emergency situations when an appointment scheduling does not allow sufficient time to place a permanent restoration. These are placed when a tooth is symptomatic or when deep caries removal is required. By placing a sedative provisional restoration, the dentist has time to evaluate the response of the pulp before reappointing the patient for a permanent restoration. So essentially, when you place a temporary or provisional uh, restoration. You're allowing the tooth time to calm down. This uh, a lot of times is done to avoid having to have a root canal. A lot of times if that um, temporary restoration does not help with pain or help relieve the symptoms of um, a lot of times it's to the point where the pulp is exposed or the cavity is that deep that any kind of air, any kind of heat um, causes a flare up for the patient, this will give that tooth time for the pulp to calm down. So if that doesn't happen, usually that's a sign that they need a root canal. Um, if it does calm down, more than likely it's just going to be a very, very large filling um, or a crown. Surgical dressings support the surgical site. They provide patient comfort and help control the bleeding as well. They are mixed to a soft putty-like consistency that hardens when placed over the tissue, forming a rigid covering. You don't see this too often. Um, I think I've seen it one time. However, different offices use different things as far as oral surgery goes. Um, this is something that is probably related more to a specialist, an oral surgeon um, that specializes in stuff like this. Properties of dental cements vary from one cement to another. No one cement is ideal for every clinical situation. 
the clinician must consider both physical and biological properties when selecting cement for each individual procedure. Cements are brittle materials with good compressive strength, but they're limited in tensile strength. Cements must be strong enough to resist the forces of mastication and the dynamics of the patient's mouth. Compressive, tensile, and flexural strengths are important considerations for different cement applications. Bond strength is important in high stress areas. Adhesive failure is seen when the prosthesis comes off cleanly, meaning that the break occurred at the interface. If a failure occurred in the bonding itself, this is called cohesive failure and is a test of the strength of the bonding material. Failure that results because the bond is stronger than the tooth structure may result in a tooth breaking rather than the restoration. The strongest cements are resin cements and the weakest is zinc oxide eugenol or ZOE. Most cements combine a powder and liquid dispensed into a specific ratio. Cements have a tendency toward dissolving in oral fluids leading to micro leakage. Most cements disintegrate in the oral environment over time. Resin cements are the closest to being insoluble. The amount of powder incorporated into the final product will influence greatly the solubility of the cement. However, this can uh, substantially increase the viscosity and make it unsuitable for use. The consistency of mixed cement is the measure of its ability to flow under pressure. This is particularly important in the case of cement used for looting because it determines the dentist's ability to seat the indirect restoration properly. For primary consistency, cement should be mixed thin to about the consistency of honey. Secondary consistency is mixed to a putty-like consistency. Temperature has a great effect on consistency of mixed cement as well. Low temps will slow the setting reaction, giving you more working time and allowing incorporation of more powder into the liquid. Many cements are a combination of a powder of zinc oxide or powdered glass and an acid. The pH of the acid, both at placement and after complete setting, is a matter of concern. Careful attention to powder to liquid ratios, dispensing technique, and mixing recommendations can minimize this concern. Retention of indirect restorations is accomplished by adhesion. Adhesion is the bonding of dissimilar materials by the attractive forces of atoms or molecules. Mechanical adhesion is based on the interlocking of one material with another and makes the restoration highly retentive and resistant to microleakage. Chemical adhesion occurs at the molecular level when atoms of the two materials swap electrons or share outer electrons. Cements are available in a variety of shades and opacities for looting porcelain veneers, ceramic or composite inlays, and porcelain full crowns. A shade is chosen that approximates the color of the restoration. Sometimes a masking shade is used to cover the discolor or discolorations or densities. Radiopacity is an important property in the measure of the success of the cement. High radiopacity will allow the cement to show when examined with x-rays so that it will not be mistaken for caries or a void. Good radiopacity will also make excess cement easier to see, which is important in the case of implants. Cements should not be stored in warm or humid areas of the dental office and, it, and can be stored in the refrigerator. It is important that cements be mixed to their appropriate consistency in accordance with manufacturer's recommendations with meticulous attention to detail. Cements that are mishandled may lead to difficulties in seeding or retaining the restoration and may promote pulp sensitivity. Cements may be hand mixed or may come in predisposed capsules and syringes. The working time and setting time are considerations in the choice of cement and mixing mechanism. The dental assistant is responsible for delivering the cement at the proper consistency within the appropriate working time. Materials that are bonded in place require the additional step of etching to achieve good bond strength. The setting of cements may be initiated by three means, self-cure, light cure, or a combination of the both, which is called dual curing. The dental assistant may be responsible for filling the crown with a looting or bonding cement before passing it to the dentist. Once mixed, the cement should be gathered at one location with the spatula, 
wipe the blade of the spatula against the margin of the restoration and cover the walls with a thin, even coating of the cement. This figure shows loading of a crown, and you can see how they're wiping the blade of the spatula against the margin of the crown. That way, all of the cement that's on the spatula gets into one area, and you may need to take the tip of the spatula to move it around inside the crown. Some cements may be wiped clean with a two by two gauze immediately after placement, whereas others must be fully set before removal. It's important to be familiar with the proper consistency recommended for the cement removal. Manufacturers instructions can assist in the removal process for each cement used within a practice. Excess cement remaining after placement of an implant is positively associated with peri-implant disease. The removal of cement before it is set provides for easier cleanup. Equipment such as amalgamators, cement activators, the outside of cement bottles, and dispensing scoops and syringes must be properly disinfected. Sterilization of mixing and delivery instruments is necessary. Proper instrumentation during prophylactic procedures and appropriate delivery of some therapeutic agents are important considerations of the continuing care of cement margins. Uh, one thing I do want to say about removing cement from the um, spatula or instruments that you're using to mix, that must be done right away because that cement can um, set on that instrument. Once it's set on that instrument, it is very, very hard to get off. A lot of times you'll have to use a scaler and sit there and scale that instrument until you can get it off. It's quite a pain in the butt, but it can be avoided. So if you wipe off that spatula right after you're done mixing or after you're done loading the crown, you can avoid that um, from happening. Zinc oxide eugenol, commonly referred to as ZOE cements, have been used widely for many years. They are available in powder to liquid and paste to paste systems. They can be used for temporary cementation, temporary and intermediate restorations, high and low strength bases, and as root canal sealers. The principal ingredient of the powder is zinc oxide and eugenol is a derivative of oil of cloves and gives it a distinct clove smell. I know when we did the, um, the uh, what is it called? The search, what is it? I can't think of the name of it right now, guys. But when we did the um, like search where things were on the first day in class, and I know some of you opened that cabinet where the cements were and it, some of you said, this smells like a dental office. Well, that's the zinc um, oxide eugenol. That's the eugenol. It's the clove smell. ZOE has a neutral pH of 7, so it's friendly to the tissue and it has low strength and high solubili solubility. Solubility, sorry. Eugenol has long been known for its sedative effect on the pulp, largely caused by its antibacterial effects. It can be irritating when in direct contact with the oral mucosa or the pulp though. When mixing, equal lengths of accelerator and base paste are placed on a proper mixing pad or a glass slab and are mixed until a uniform color is achieved. If the powder to liquid form is used, the powder is incorporated into the liquid until the desired consistency is achieved. You must be sure to wipe clean the surface of the glass slab and spatulas because these cements are very difficult to remove. Zinc phosphate, which is set through an acid-base reaction, is the oldest of the cements, having been used for longer than 100 years. It's recognized for its problems with hypersensitivity and not widely used today. It's available in a powdered liquid system, which can be mixed only on a cool glass slab. The powder of the zinc phosphate is principally zinc oxide, and the liquid is made from phosphoric acid in water. When mixed, the chemical reaction causes an exothermic reaction. The setting and exothermic reaction are controlled by time and temperature. Incremental incorporation of the powder into the liquid allows for controlled dissipation of heat. Mixing over a large area of a cooled glass slab also dissipates the heat. The acidity, which is 4.2, is low and becomes neutral within 24 to 48 hours. The initially low acidity can cause pulp irritation. Zinc phosphate is also highly soluble. Zinc polycarboxylate, 
cement sets through an acid-base reaction. It can be used for final cementation of an indirect restoration, but today they are primarily used for long-term temporary cements. Zinc polycarboxylate is su supplied as a powder to liquid system and may be supplied in a pre-dose capsule for mixing in an amalgamator. The powder is essentially zinc oxide and the liquid is an aqueous solution of pliacrylic ply acid, which produces little irritation to the pulp. It has high viscosity that may be thinned upon uh, vibratory action and never by adding more liquid as this will dramatically reduce the strength. These cements have lower compressive strength and higher solubility, good Lord, <laughs> solubility when compared with other cements. Glass ionomer was originally developed for aesthetic restoration of anterior teeth and later used as a permanent looting agent. They are used as permanent looting agents, looting of orthodontic bands and brackets, restorative materials, low and high strength bases, and core buildups. The powder is an aluminum fluorosilicate glass with barium glass added for radiopacity and the liquid is a polyacrylic acid copolymer in water. When mixed, the polyacrylic acid attacks the glass to release the fluoride ions. Mild to severe postoperative sensitivity has been reported. Fluoride release during the life of the cement has an anti-carcinogenic effect. An increase in solubility has been demonstrated with early moisture contamination during the first 24 hours. Hybrid ionomer cements are similar to glass ionomer. However, they have been modified with the addition of resin. The resin helps to improve the bond strength and to decrease the solubility. The fluoride release is the same as that of a glass ionomer. Expansion of the material as it absorbs moisture after setting is a matter of concern, and it's not recommended for ceramic restoration cementation. Resin cements are basically modified composites used to bond ceramic and direct restorations, conventional crowns and bridges, and to indirectly bond orthodontic brackets. Resin-based cements are available as light-cured, dual-cured, and self-cured. Traditional adhesive resin-based cements utilize the three-step etch, prime, and bond adhesive technique. Cements are chosen to match the physical properties of the restorative material being used and the specifics of each clinical situation. Proper manipulation of the cement before it's delivered to the dentist plays a huge part in determining the quality of the physical properties. If you guys happen to have any questions over what we went over in lecture, I know it can be kind of a lot because there's many cements to choose from, please feel free to email me at hwells14 at ivytech.edu.